number 118, and we're going to talk about the subject of riches, the subject of riches. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight. Please bless our Bible study. Help it to be profitable for all of our faith and our relationship with you and the will of God for our lives. Lord, if there's anybody among us that needs to be saved or baptized, Lord, please help them to make those important decisions tonight. Father, bless us in a great way, and all those that are watching online, bless them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. Miss uh, Kim, if you could... Uh, if you can write this down real quick, I forgot all about this, but in the bulletin, we need to put the uh, month of December sale for the bookstore, 50% off. And then if we can put a note about the Wi-Fi for the church, for nobody to be on it at all uh, during church services. And if we can, uh, for our next bulletin, that would be great. Thank you, Miss Kim. All right. So, riches tonight. We're going to give you, just go right through. I got 37 points to give you. And so let's quickly go through this, fill in the blanks as we go. Number one, riches defined. There are three basic definition definitions in, the, in our dictionary, the 1828 Webster's Dictionary of the word riches. Number one, it's wealth, opulence, affluence, possessions of land, good or money in abundance. So that's the first definition of the word riches rich number two splendid sumptuous appearance like a rich appearance then the third in scripture an abundance of spiritual blessings and um and we're going to talk about throughout the whole bible study tonight definitions one and three when it comes to um, um application tonight for the bible study number two you say, why are we talking about riches? Well, the word rich or riches or richly or richer appears in 172 verses in the Bible. 172. The word lucre, and we're going to talk about that at the very end. The word lucre appears in six verses of the Bible. None of this is including the verses that have the words wealth or treasures and those are often synonymous with the word rich so we're just looking i looked at all 178 verses in preparing this bible study tonight but we're just going to talk about the verses in the bible that have the word rich in it or the word lucre all right number three here we go let's just get right with it to be rich is not a sin nor is not of god Number two, to be rich is not a sin, nor is it to, uh, not of God. Okay, let's, let's read Genesis 13, verses 1 and 2. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. You know the story. Abram um, became the father of the faith, the father of the Hebrew race, and the father of those of us who are saved through Christ. And God changed his name from Abram to Abraham. And now he was a very rich man. Now listen carefully. That was not sinful. And it wasn't that God didn't want him to be rich. So as we study the subject of riches, number one, uh, just understand this. If you do get rich, it's not a sin. And people who are rich, it's not a sin. And it is never to say, well, it's not of God for anybody to be rich. That is not true. So point number three, to be rich is not a sin, nor is it not of God. So in other words, sometimes God wants some people to be rich, and those who are rich, we cannot just automatically say they're sinning. Okay, number four, how one gets rich is important. How one gets rich is important. And we're going to talk about applications for this all throughout the Bible study. But let's take a look at Abraham again. Genesis 14, verses 21 through 24. It says, And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, 
I have made Abraham rich, save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men which went with me, Anner, Eshcol, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. All right, uh, Abraham was engaged in a war uh, with uh, with Sodom together, uh, a, a, a common enemy. All right, so uh, Lot had gone to Sodom, and then someone came and attacked Sodom, and Lot was taken with them in captivity. And so Abraham said, I'm getting my nephew back, and uh, you guys aren't taking him. And so he joined arms, if you please, with Sodom to go to that enemy. Now, Abraham wasn't going to war to help Sodom out at all, but just to get Lot and his family back. And so then when it was all done, Abraham helped to win the war. The king of Sodom said, here, let me give you some, some riches and some, some things. And he said, no way, Jose. That's in the Hebrew, by the way. Uh, no way, Jose. He said, I am not taking a dime from you. And he goes, not even a shoe latchet. I don't want anything from you lest you go around Sodom, king of Sodom, which was a wicked city. You go around telling people, hey, I'm the one that made Abraham rich. He got all of his wealth and riches from me. He goes, nobody's going to ever say that because I'm not taking a single shoe latchet from you. Nothing. So why? Are you listening? Because how you get rich is important. How you make your money is important. Um, there are certain industries that I would never want to be associated with in America because I don't want to get rich because of what they do. I think of abortion clinics and things along those lines. I think of selling alcohol. The Bible says every single person that has anything to do with putting a bottle of alcohol into the hand of someone to drink is cursed by God. I would not want to make riches off of alcohol. I wouldn't want to make riches off of things like Hollywood. You know, all the movies that they make, all the sinful, wicked, sensual movies. I wouldn't want to get rich from those means. I mean, just on and on and on. So here's Abraham saying, I don't want anything from you, King of Sodom, because I don't want you to tell people that you gave me what I have and made me rich. I want nothing from you because I don't want to become rich from you all right so how one gets rich is important number five god expects rich and poor to give equally in proportion god expects rich and poor to give equally in proportion exodus 30 verses 14 and 15 everyone that passeth among them that are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering unto the lord the rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for their souls. So here's what God says. Everyone that's 20 years of age and older of the Hebrew family, they were supposed to, all of the, all of the Hebrew people, they're all supposed to give an offering to the Lord to make an atonement for their souls. And he said, the rich are not going to give more than the poor and the poor are not going to give less than the rich. Everybody's going to give equally the same. And then if you look at 2 Corinthians 8, and uh, verses 12 through 15, it says, For if there, first, uh, excuse me, if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased, because they're poor, and ye burdened, if you're rich, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, and their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. Okay, when it comes to giving to the kingdom of God, God says it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, we're supposed to give equally. How's that work? With proportion. So 10% is 10% if you're rich, 10% is 10% if you're poor. It does not matter. If you make $100 in a week, you owe God 10 bucks. If you make $10,000 in a week, you owe God $1,000. It absolutely does not matter your financial status. When it comes to giving offerings to God, everybody is supposed to have an equal weight, an equal proportion, and it's all based on percentages. It is wrong for people 
to think so-and-so has money, so they should give more than 10%. I'm struggling to pay my bills, so God understands I can't even give 10%. Listen carefully. You are not tithing if you're not giving 10%. You're not. And there has never been a financial hardship that I have ever gone through, that I ever tried to justify not tithing. Every dime that I have ever made from age 17 when I started tithing to age 54, all these 37 years, every dime that I have ever made, God has gotten at least a penny from me. Every single dime. Now, it's wrong again for people to think, well, so-and-so has more money, so they should give more. No, God says not that you should be burdened and others should be eased. He said there should be an equality. And obviously, the more money that God allows you to have, then that means the more you can give as far as numerically concerned. But percentage-wise, God expects us all to pull our weight, whether you're rich or poor. Number six, it is the Lord who maketh rich. It is the Lord who maketh rich. First Samuel 2, verse 7, the Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. That means God up in heaven decides who's poor, and he, he decides who gets rich. He's the one that makes it all happen. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 17 and 18, And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. Don't ever think that if you do become rich and get rich, that it's you doing it for yourself. It's God that gives you the power to do so. First Chronicles 29, verses 11 and 12. Thine own, or excuse me, thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. That means God owns everything on the planet. All your money, my money, all the money in the world. He owns it all, right? It's all his. Now watch this. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord. Thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee. And thou reignest over all. And in thy hand is power and might and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all all right god clearly says god owns every dime on this planet every single dime and it's him he's the one that says both riches and honor come of of thee or of him he's the one and then ecclesiastes 5 verse 19 every man also to whom god hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof, and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. So here's what God says. It is a gift from me if you become rich. It's a gift. And God says, you know, if you ever think that you got it all by yourself, he says, I can show you very quickly that it wasn't that way. The Bible tells us God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. All the gold and the silver on the earth belongs to the Lord. He's the one that decides who gets what belongs to him as far as he owns everything, right? If you, have, if you own a house today, it's because God allowed you to have it. If you own a car today, it's because God allowed you to have it. If you have money in the bank account today, it's because God has allowed you to have it. The best thing for you to do is recognize that and always honor God with what he gives you. Always honor him. All right, next, number seven. Now, this is important for you to understand. Never ask riches of God for yourself. Never ask riches of God for yourself. This is a famous story about King Solomon when he first became king in Israel. It says in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 through 14, in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Jump down to verse 9. Give therefore, <coughs> Solomon responds to God, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. God said unto him, because thou hast asked this thing and hast not asked thy, uh, for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked 
the life of thine enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any rise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be uh, any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. All right, here's Solomon. God came to him in a dream, said, ask anything you want, Solomon, and I'll give it to you. And here's what he said. I need under, an understanding heart. Another passage says he said wisdom and understanding. And, and, and God said, okay, I'm so impressed. I'm going to give you what you asked for, but I'm also going to give you what you didn't ask for. I'm going to give you uh, um, peace during your time as king, I'm going to give you riches. And if you walk after my commandments like David did, I'll also give you long life. And so, but never, 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 never ask of God to give you riches for yourself. That ain't going to impress him. When you don't care about that, that's the best chance that God's going to give you riches. It's when you don't care about it. All right, number eight. A little is better than the riches of the wicked. A little is better than the riches of the wicked. Psalm 37, verse 16. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. All right, so God says, if you have a little bit, but you have righteousness with it, that's better than if you have great riches and abundance of things, but yet with the wicked to go along with it. It's better to have a little than the riches of the wicked. Number nine, riches do not matter when standing before God. Riches do not matter when standing before God. Psalm 49, verses six, seven, and eight, they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him for the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceaseth forever. Proverbs 11 verse 4, riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. And then Proverbs 22 verse 2, the rich and poor meet together. The Lord is maker of them all. Do you know when you, when you stand before God, you're going to stand before him naked. You're not going to have any possessions. You're not going to have any money. You're not going to have any accolades. You're not going to have anything. You're going to stand before God naked. And the Bible says all of us who are rich and poor, we stand before God the same way. And the Bible says you can't redeem the soul of your brother with riches. He says you couldn't buy your way to heaven. Even if you had all the money in the world, you could not do it. And then he also said, riches profit not in the day of wrath. He said, if you're going to be judged by God and wrath from God is going to come upon you, all the amount of money you have can alleviate what's coming. You can't buy your way out of the wrath of God. And so riches do not matter when standing before God. Number 10. We cannot take our riches with us after death. We cannot take our riches with us after death. Psalm 49, verses 16 through 20, the Bible says this, um, Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him, though while he liveth, he blessed his soul. And men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. Excuse me. They shall never see light. Man that is in honor and understandeth not is like the beasts that perish. You know what God says? He says, <laughs> you're like an animal if you think your riches are going to go with you in the next life. He says, you don't understand. You're like, you're like a dog or a cat. You're like a, a birds of the air and the fish of the sea. They don't have any riches. They ain't taking none of it with them. When they die, nothing that they have in this life matters in the life to come as far as possessions. And God says, you need to get it through your head that whatever you have now, it says in verse 17, for when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. Now, men think, oh, the more I have, the better my life is. 
Yeah, maybe while you're alive, but you realize that your eternity is going to be so much longer than whatever amount of years you live on this planet. And if I were you, I wouldn't live for the riches of this world and think that it's going to make anything better in the world to come because it's not. We cannot take our riches with us after death. Number 11, it is foolish to trust in riches. It is foolish to trust in riches. Psalm 52, verses 5 through 7. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. Selah. The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. Proverbs eleven twenty eight. He that trusteth in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. Just to put it simply, it is foolish to trust in riches. If you ever get wealthy and ever get riches and you think your life is secure and everything's going to be just fine because you have riches, you're a fool. You're an absolute fool. He that trusteth in his riches shall fall. Not maybe fall, not um, has a good chance of falling. No, shall fall. And then it says, um, you'll, you'll, people will look at you in amazement. This is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches. Look, look what happened to him. That's exactly what happens to every person who trusts in their riches. Number, number 12, here's something that you need to really take to heart. Set not your heart upon riches. Set not your heart upon riches. Psalm 62, verse 10, trust not in, in oppression and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. You know what God says? If I happen to allow you to get rich, don't fall in love with the riches that you get. Set not your heart upon riches. And I'm just telling you, you'll, you'll, you're setting yourself up for disappointment in life if you do. Uh, next, wisdom, number 13. Wisdom is better than riches. Wisdom is better than riches. Proverbs 3, verses 13 through 18. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it, that's wisdom, is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. She, that's wisdom, is more precious than rubies. And all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. That's wisdom. Length of days is in her right hand, wisdom's hand. And in her left hand, wisdom's left hand, riches and honor. Her ways, wisdom's ways, are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths, wisdom's paths, are peace. She, wisdom, is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, or wisdom, and happy is everyone that retaineth her, and that's wisdom. Wisdom is better than riches. If you have to choose wisdom or riches, 100% of the time, you should choose wisdom. Seeing life from God's point of view is far better. It'll make you happier. It'll make you um, your life better if you have wisdom than if you have riches. Number 14, diligent people are rewarded with riches. Diligent people are rewarded with riches. Proverbs 10 verse 4, he, that be he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. Do you know what a slack hand is? It's laziness. God says laziness will cause you to become poor. Then it says, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. One of the things that I've tried as a father, and I have failed in many, many ways. However, one thing I tried to impart to my boys is if they would learn to work hard, their life would be better. And that's what diligence is, working hard. If you develop the character of being a hard worker, then that's the best chance you have at getting rich. I mean, that really is. Laziness, you will always become poor. Anybody that has their heart set to laziness, you can forget about having a wonderful life, a prosperous life, a blessed life. Laziness is of the devil. 
It's evil. It's a cancer to the soul, and it's a cancer to someone's life. One of the best things you could ever do is learn to be a hard worker. And parents, one of the best things you could ever teach your children is to be hard workers. It really does make a difference. Uh, diligent people are rewarded with riches. Number 15, the blessing of the Lord is the best riches. The blessing of the Lord is the best riches. Look what it says in Proverbs 10, 22. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. Romans 2, verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, that's his blessing, and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God or the blessings of God leadeth thee to repentance. Listen to me carefully. The blessings of the Lord, that's the best kind of riches. If you say, God, I want a lot of money in the bank or the blessing of God on my life, you choose the blessing of God all 100% of the time. The blessing of the Lord. If God blesses your life, that is the most rich life you could possibly have. The most rich life. Next, number 16. A good name is better than great riches. A good name is better than great riches. Proverbs 22, verse 1, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. If you have to choose, people know that you're wealthy or people think of you as a good person. You choose good person. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. I'd rather be have a good name and be poor than have great riches and people think of me as a evil person or a lazy person or a bad person or a godless person or you know someone that's wicked no no i'd rather have a good name a good name is better than great riches all right number 17 hey we're halfway done here we go humility and fear of the lord precede riches humility and fear of the lord precede Riches, Proverbs 22, verse 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. If you ever think, you know, it'd be nice to be rich one day without really craving it and, and, and really wanting it and loving it and all of that stuff. Well, he said, how, how, would, how would I live in such a way that God would bless me with riches? Two things, humility and the fear of the Lord. If you have both of those things, then maybe in your future you can be rich. All right, next, number 18. Here's something that a lot of Americans just flat out have wrong. Never labor to be rich. Never labor to be rich. That's a direct command from God. In Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5, labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that? which is not for riches, certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. You know what God says? Now it's going to be 100% honest with this statement. If you work a job for the intent to get rich, you're sinning. Labor not to be rich. There are four things. What is the reason one should labor? Four things in this order. Uh, letter A. To invest in the kingdom of God. Number one, to invest in the kingdom of God. Do you know, by the way, this is number one priority. Do you know why some people are hit and miss with their tithes? Do you know why some people who come to our church and churches like ours who believe the Bible go to, you know, go to church, um, they, they go soul winning maybe, they serve in a ministry maybe, whatever. You know why they don't tithe? Because that's not number one on their list. Why should you work a job? Number one, number one so that you can invest in the kingdom of God. That's the number one reason why you should work a job. Number two, let letter B, to provide for your own. To provide for your own. That's daily needs, that's insurance, that's savings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's number two. And by the way, God says if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. The Bible says if a man provides not for his own, he is worse than an infidel. Now, here's where the problem comes with our American way of thinking. Number one is responsibilities to our family, and that is not true. 
Your number one responsibility is to God. And if you don't get that figured out, money will always be a problem in your life. I mean, it will always be a problem in your life. If you ever get money and you say, I just don't think I can afford to tithe this week, your whole priority is out of whack. I mean, it's just out of whack. You do not labor to provide for your own first. You labor to tithe, and again, and, and to invest in the kingdom of God. If you do not give God 10% of all your increase, you are not a tither. Now, you may put money in the offering plate, but you're not a tither. Now, all of us can tithe. All of us can. But some of us can go beyond the tithe. Not all of us can do that, but most of us can. I, my wife and I give 30 to 35% of all of our increase to the Lord. That's what we live off of. We live off of 65 to 70%, and we give to the Lord 30 to 35%. Now, it's possible that all of us could get to something like that, but there's no doubt whatsoever every single person can tithe every single person if you got your priorities right. Letter A, invest in the kingdom of God. Letter B, to provide for your own. Letter C, to be a blessing to others. <sighs> to be a blessing to others. That's the third reason you labor. You say, why should I work? Because if there's poor people, you can help them. If someone needs to eat food, you can you can help them. Uh, this past Sunday, I was so proud of some of our church family. We had a, a, a family in our church that has been without heat and they have a slum lord for a landlord who will not fix their furnace man that kind of stuff angers the fire out of me almost as much as the insurance uh people <laughs> anger the fire out of me but we had three families in our church brought a a, a space heater for them to have heat in their in their um, in, in, in their trailer why because i mean listen if you make money if you labor, that's one of the reasons that you ought to be able to work a job so you can provide for someone's needs. I mean, can you imagine when it got so cold last week and not having heat in your home? Like no heat whatsoever. But those of us that work jobs and, are, and that we labor, well, if we handle our finances properly, we have an opportunity to be a blessing to people like that. So I said, number one, or letter A, the reason you should work a job you should labor is to invest in the kingdom of God. Letter B, to provide for your own. Letter C, to be a blessing to others. Letter D, to enjoy the things of life. To enjoy the things of life. What's that? Oh, you know, going out to eat at a restaurant. You realize that's, a, that's not a necessity. It's just an enjoyment. And there's nothing wrong with going out to eat at a restaurant. Buying something on the internet on, you know, um, Black Friday or, or Cyber Monday, something that's on sale that you've always wanted, nothing wrong with that. Going on vacation, nothing wrong with that, as long as you do the other three things first. We have it so upside down. I've had people say to me over the years, I just can't afford to tithe. Man, they travel so much. They go on vacation every other month. They're buying timeshares. They're going to, you know, Disney World. They're going to the Grand Canyon. They're going to Niagara Falls. They're go but they can't afford to tithe. Huh. You see, when we get our financial priorities mixed up, God never blesses that. And people struggle. But I promise you this. If you have a job, if you labor, if you'll put it in this order— you labor to invest in the kingdom of God. Number two, to provide for your own. Number three, to be a blessing to others. Number four, to enjoy the things of life. God will bless your finances. And you just might, maybe, he might be able to trust you with riches. But not in this order. He won't trust you. Number 19, riches are not forever. <sighs> Number 19, Riches are not forever. Proverbs 27, verse 24, for riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure to every generation? The answer is no. Riches are not forever. I mean, and, and that forever is forever in our life. Just because someone may be rich today, it does not guarantee that they'll be rich tomorrow. Riches are not forever. Number 20, this is why you should never play the lottery. Point number 20, listen to it very carefully. Never try to get rich quickly. Never try to get rich quickly. Proverbs 28, 
Verse 20, a faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Verse 22, he that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. What does it mean to haste to be rich? It means to get rich quick. That's what the lottery does. It tells people, if you buy this winning lottery ticket, you will win and get rich overnight. The whole idea of getting rich in a haste or quickly, it is wrong. You should never gamble. The, point number 20, never go to Blackhawk, never go to the casinos, never, 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 never try to get rich quick. God says it is a sin. Just like it is a sin to labor to get rich, it is a sin to try to get rich hastily or quickly. Never do that. Next, number 21. Here's something really hard to take to heart. Riches do not satisfy. Riches do not satisfy. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 8. There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all his labor. Look what it says now. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. Riches never satisfy. The, the more, if you want to be rich, you will never be rich enough. You never will. Why does a billionaire still take a salary? I'm telling you, I'm telling you, a normal human being, just normal human being, you could not spend a billion dollars in your lifetime. You know what a billion dollars is? It is 1,000 millions. 1,000 million. I mean, it's, look, who wants to be a millionaire? Well, you could probably spend at least, you know, 10 million in your lifetime, 20 million. You know, sometimes, you know, I guess if you, if you really think about it, maybe you can spend 50 million in your lifetime. I know there are certain houses that you can buy that are multiple million dollar homes. You could buy jet airplanes, you could buy cars, and you can spend millions in your lifetime. I, I can't remember what someone did a, a computation. If you spent a billion dollars in your lifetime over the course of like 60 years, I can't remember the exact number, but it was some outrageous number that, you know, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. You know, if you're, okay, no, no, no. If you had a, uh, well, at any rate, um, it's just you're not going to spend a, a billion dollars in a lifetime. So what are these billionaires on our planet doing making more money? Again, Miss Brenda, where's my Dutch brother cough card? I'm telling you. But uh, anyway, or Miss Raquel, whoever. But uh, <laughs> so here we go. Um, the end. No, here we go. Okay. Um, riches do not satisfy. If you live your life to pursue riches, you will never have enough because it never, ever satisfies. Next, number 22. The more riches one has, the more one worries. The more riches one has, the, the more one worries. Ecclesiastes 5.12, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Do you see what that says? God says if you're a laboring man, if you work hard for what you have, whether you have a little or much, your sleep is sweet. But a rich person it's hard for them to sleep because they're worried that someone's going to steal their money. They're worried that the stock market's going to crash. They're worried that some catastrophe is going to happen. They're worried that whatever. So when you, the more riches you have, most people, this is how it is, they worry more. They don't feel secure. They don't feel safe. People, like they don't trust people. Why are you my friend? Because you want me to give you money, don't you? You're not, you're not a friend to me because you just want to be my friend. You're a friend to me because of my riches, aren't you? See, that, that's, how, that's how rich people are. They, it, 
rich people, uh, often they worry a lot because they have a lot to worry over. Number 23, never glory in your riches. We got to hurry. Never glory in your riches. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgments, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Don't ever glory in your riches. You should glory in the fact that you know God and you understand him and you're in his family. Number 24, getting rich by unjust means will not turn out well. Getting rich by unjust means will not turn out well. Jeremiah 17, 11, as the partridge sitteth on eggs and hatcheth them not, so he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days and at his end shall be a fool. You know what God says? If you get rich by not right, by not doing right, at the end you're going to be nothing but a fool. Number 25, rich people often struggle with pride. Rich people often struggle with pride. They don't have to, but often they do. Um, Ezekiel 28, verse 5, By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. That's why it's so hard to get rich people to come to church. They're so easily offended. They got so much pride so often. Not 100% of the rich people, but it's a temptation that if you're rich, you think you're better than other people. If you're rich, you think the preaching doesn't apply to you because you're wealthy. No, no. You're just like everybody else. I heard one, um, one preacher said this. A millionaire puts his pants on the same way I do every day, one leg at a time. That's it. They're just people. That's what they are. They're people. They're not something else. And so many of those rich people, though, they get lifted up with pride. Next, number 26, riches are deceitful. Riches are deceitful. Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Are you listening? Okay. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. You see, there are people in this world that because they have money, they think they're better, or they think they have all that they need. They're deceived by riches. And God says, you, you have a lot, you're rich, but what you don't realize, he said, is you, you know not that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked in the eyes of God. So riches are deceitful. Number 27, it is hard for rich people to get saved. It is hard for rich people to get saved. Matthew 19, 23, and 24, Then said Jesus to his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's so sad. A lot of rich people don't, don't really believe they need Jesus. It's just sad. Number 28, we're on the last page. We're almost done. Number 28, riches often get in the way of living for God. Riches often get in the way of living for God. Mark chapter 4, verse 19, in the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. Luke 8, verse 14, and that which fell, fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Listen to me very carefully. There is not a job in this world that is worth you sacrificing your relationship with God. There's not. 
There's not the deceitfulness of riches. I've got to have this job. So you miss church. You don't tithe. You don't go soul winning. You're not engaged in the ministry. You're not living for God. All because of a job? It's not worth it, folks. It's just not worth it. It's deceitful. And riches often get in the way. You become unfruitful, it says in Mark 4, 19. And then it says you bring no fruit to perfection. That means you don't really fully complete what God had for you to do in this world because of the deceitfulness of riches. God bless you. Number 29, it is foolish to be rich now, but not in eternity. It is foolish to be rich now, but not in eternity. Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. How foolish we are to be rich in this life and not be rich in eternity. If you have to choose one or the other, choose being rich in eternity, you're going to spend a lot more time there than you are here. You know why people don't care about getting rich in eternity? Because they really don't believe heaven's real. They don't. All they believe is what they see and feel and touch now. That's all they believe is the now. And that's why they don't care. A lot of people who are saved, they really don't believe in heaven. Not the way the Bible describes it. Because they're not, they don't care about laying up treasures in heaven. They just are consumed with treasures now. Next, number 30. It is better to pursue the true riches. It is better to pursue the true riches. Luke 16, 11, If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, Who will commit to your trust the true riches? You know what this verse tells me? The unrighteous mammon, that's talking about the riches of this world. He said, that's not the true riches. There is something else that is true riches. And of course, that's being rich in God. Number 31, be rich in liberality. Be rich in liberality. 2 Corinthians 8 verses 1 and 2, moreover brethren we do to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty financially speaking deep poverty it says abounded unto the riches of their liberality. The word liberality there is not talking about a political party. It's talking about freely giving of what you have to others. Being liberal in this sense is being giving to others. And this is a church that had deep poverty, but they were rich in their liberality. That's a good way to live. Be rich in liberality. Number 32, Jesus became poor so that we could be rich. Jesus became poor so that we could be rich. Second Corinthians 8 verse 9, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, he owned everything in the universe, yet for your sakes he became poor that ye through his poverty might be rich. That's what Jesus did for us. And guess what? If you want to become a Christian like Jesus was, then that needs to be your mindset. You are willing to help others be rich and not yourself. That's what Jesus, that's how he he became poor that we might be rich. And that's what it is to be Christ-like. Next, verse 30, or point 33. God has riches enough to provide all our needs. God has riches enough to provide all our needs. Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God has riches enough to provide all our needs. Number 34, those who desire to be rich fall. Those who desire to be rich. That's why not one person in this room 
should ever desire to be rich. Look what it says, 1 Timothy 6, 9, but they that will be rich, that's desire to be rich, fall, not maybe, they will fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. To me, that doesn't seem like a very fun way to live. Don't ever desire to be rich or you, you will fall. Number 35, if you, if you become rich, stay humble and trust in God. If you become rich, stay humble and trust in God. First Timothy 6, 17, charge them that are rich in this world. If you're rich, it's not a sin, and it doesn't mean God doesn't want you to be, but if you are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, that means be humble, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. So if you do become rich, stay humble and trust in God. Number 36, it is better to be rich in faith. It is better to be rich in faith. James 2 verse 5, hearken my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world? Rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. Revelation 2, 9, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. It is better to be rich in faith than it is to be rich in this world. Number 37 and last, woohoo, we made it. It is filthy to pursue gain by ill means. It is filthy to pursue gain by ill means. That's what it means, filthy lucre. 1 Samuel 8, verse 3, and his sons, talking about Samuel's sons, walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. I'm sorry, that was uh, yeah, that's Samuel's sons. And they were saying, we don't want your, ch your, your children to reign over us. We need a king. They were clamoring for a king because Samuel's adult sons, they, they, they took bribes and perverted judgment. They went after lucre. Lucre is ill gain, and God calls it filthy. Titus 1, 7, for a bishop or a pastor is what it's referring to, must be blameless as the steward of God. Not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. Verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped to subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And then lastly, 1 Peter 5, 2, talking about the pastor. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. It is filthy, God says, to pursue gain by ill means. So we've learned a lot tonight about riches. However, God spoke to your heart. I would just encourage you to please respond accordingly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord. And I thank you, Father, for your goodness and, and kindness and grace and love. And Lord, thank you for the word of God. What a wonderful book it is. Now, Lord, I pray that every one of us tonight, we listen carefully, and I pray that we'll respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit of God as God has spoken to us. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Please, nobody looking around. I wonder how many of you are here tonight. You'd say, preacher, somewhere along tonight's message, God clearly spoke to my heart about the subject of riches, one or more of those points, whatever the case may be, would you just simply pray for me as God has spoken to my heart that I would do what God said. Would you raise your hand? Preacher, here's my hand. Pray for me. God spoke to me. Heavenly Father, you see the hands that are raised. I pray you bless each and every one of them. Thank you for the privilege and honor of being in the house of God tonight. Please bless this invitation. Let it bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? The pianist is playing. If God spoke to your heart, if you want to come to the altar and pray, you can come down at this time. You can obviously pray in the pew, but if you'd like to pray at the altar,